Science Fiction The Space Age The Future Rockets Spaceships Ray Guns Laser Swords Cyborgs Cylons Robots Replicants Androids Aliens The sky is the limit. So what exactly is science fiction anyway? According to the definition, it's fiction based on imagined future. Scientific or technological advances. And major social or environmental changes. Frequently portraying space. Or time travel. And life on other planets. While there's certainly no shortage of ideas when it comes to the genre, it has also provided a stage for many powerful roles played by women. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Or so the saying goes. Replacing your former yeoman, sir. No, she does a good job, all right. It's just that I can't get used to having a woman on the bridge. Since science fiction has always been predominantly male-dominated... No offense, Lieutenant. You're different, of course. Any female characters wanting to step up in the genre had to be strong, a term previously associated with males. But what is a strong male, or female character for that matter? Of course, physicality can have something to do with it. Good morning, Dr. Silverman. How's the knee? But more importantly, a character should be well-defined, with purpose and subtext relevant to the plot. The Imperial Senate will not sit still for this. When they hear you've attacked a diplomatic... Don't act so surprised. ...and not just there for dressing. In the time before the women's rights movement of the 1960s, females in cinema were often just that. How do they wear their hair? Who? The women of your time. Up like that. Show me. But as the 21st century drew closer, strong roles for women started appearing in cinema, and on television, especially in science fiction. And you're saying medically the risk is unacceptable? The risk is great. The decision, of course, is yours. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise to boldly go where no man has gone before. While the 1960s kick-started equality for all, the language itself still had some catching up to do. I think I'm gonna like Argelius. Obviously a man of good taste. In the early Star Trek universe, men were still captains, and doctors, and pilots and engineers, and pretty much everything else. But heading the gift of the gab, and telecommunications operation and alien translation extraordinaire, sporting a mighty miniskirt uniform, was none other than Nichelle Nichols, playing a pivotal role in science fiction television. Nyota Ohura not only had an important position, but she got to hang with the boys on the bridge, Nichols went on to play Uhura in six motion picture films over several decades, smashing sexism, racism, and eventually even ageism out of the ballpark. Yeah, well, maybe that's okay for someone like you, whose career is winding down. Her character has been adored by many, 
and an inspiration to other actors who would also join Star Trek in spin-off programs. He's talking about slavery. I think that's a little harsh. And reimagined versions of the original series. Yours burning? Star Trek paved the way for minority groups and women in science fiction. And for the first time, we soon got to see princesses that were doing just fine without Prince Charming. Short for a stormtrooper. Huh? Leia Organa, or more popularly known as Princess Leia, played by Carrie Fisher, burst onto the screen in 1977's first epic Star Wars tale. Not only was she strong, she wasn't putting up with any male preconceptions of what a princess should be. Hey, your worship, I'm only trying to help. Would you please stop calling me that? Sure, Leia. Even though there was still a long way to go in dressing the dames of science fiction, their presence in such movies drew in new audiences and provided young girls with a new kind of role model for the first time. The objectification of women in cinema is an issue that has plagued Hollywood since the silent era. This scene in Ridley Scott's Alien movie created a stir amongst some groups. Even James Cameron, who directed the sequel to Alien, criticized the first movie for this particular scene. Others argue that Ellen Ripley's disrobing is very symbolic and shows the vulnerability of the human animal. Sigourney Weaver, who played Ripley, even argued that after what her character had been through, it was a very natural thing to want to de-uniform and discard the blood and sweat-soaked clothing of her ordeal. Weaver returned to play the character again in Aliens. In the second film, having experienced the predatory instincts of the alien species, she stands out as the only crew member, truly aware of the severity of the circumstances. God damn it, that's not all! Because if one of those things gets down here, then that will be all. Then all of this that you think is so important, you can just kiss all that goodbye. When they come across a child, hiding out on the alien-dominated outpost, she becomes a protector to the young girl, making up for missing her own daughter's life back on Earth. Hard to believe there's a little girl under all this. The part awarded her a nomination for Best Actress in the sequel, and her character is seen as one of the most important female protagonists, not only in the genre, but in all of cinema history. Very few characters have had their names embedded in three generations of popular culture. In the 1984 science fiction slash horror flick, The Terminator, also directed by James Cameron, the world was introduced to Sarah Connor, a young waitress learning to get by in a rough and tough world, for me, big bands. targeted by a killer cyborg from the future for the son she was yet to have. His name is Connor. John Connor, your son, Sarah. The young woman is hurtled into a world of fear and desperation as she tries to escape an unstoppable killing machine. As Sarah's world is turned upside down, she has to become a survivor or the future of humanity will end. Much like Ellen Ripley from Alien, once the men who helped to protect her have failed to survive, Sarah finds herself on her own. He said there's a storm coming in. And must face the world alone. I know. By the time we see her in the next movie, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, she has completely transformed into a kind of machine of her own. Like in Aliens, she has also become a mother figure and a protector 
and puts the life of a child before her own. I said it was okay. John, it was stupid of you to go there. God damn it, you have to be smarter than that. You almost got yourself killed. Many would argue that the stories in both films should have ended here, but they would reappear in several more movies in the years following in which everything invested in surviving the traumatic events of part two would be destroyed by poor plot choices and an unparalleled failure to respect the plight of two remarkably resilient legends of the silver screen. Long before the blockbuster Independence Day, the Earth had already been invaded by giant motherships. They appeared over every major city in the world, during the northern summer of 1983. They came in peace. Or so they said. The miniseries V, created by Kenneth Johnson, was a television sci-fi hit around the world. Only second in command was Diana, played by actress Jane Badler. But in reality, she was the one in charge of the mothership stationed over Los Angeles, and probably the entire invading fleet. Such a strong and feisty character, she would later topple her Supreme Commander John, and anyone else who stood in her way. If Diana was night, then her opposition was day. Julie Parrish, played by Faye Grant, was a leader also. But rather than leading by force, and a desire for power like her alien counterpart, Julie reluctantly took the position of head of the resistance. Both characters were intelligent, and beautifully juxtaposed each other in an unforgettable mini-series. Julie, let me help you out of this place. So intriguing, was the way Diana related to her competition, when the miniseries was continued into a regular series, Lydia entered the scene. The relationship between the two visitor commanders was often bitter and brutal, proving that even reptilian aliens are just as vindictive as humans. Jane Badler went on to play a character of the same name in a reimagined version of the series. But she met her demise by the new queen on the block, her daughter, Anna. Diana was probably the most memorable character from all the series, and Jane would soon be seen again as the leading female agent of IMF, in a 1980s remake, of the 60s hit television action series, Mission Impossible. As the 1970s gave rise to a new decade, the following ten years would be pivotal in science fiction television. Shows like Battlestar Galactica, the Greatest American Hero V Quantum Leap and Star Trek The Next Generation brought enthralling science fiction back into the living room. Following on from the original series, Star Trek The Next Generation was set about a century after the original series. The starship was a later model, bearing the same name, Enterprise, the crew of The Next Generation was led by Captain Jean-Luc Picard, and featured several well-scripted, strong female characters. And then I just slapped him. The first being, Dr. Beverly Crusher, played by Gates McFadden. The Doctor was a good counterpart for the Captain, often challenging him on his decisions, but also being the one who was closest to him. Perhaps someday I will marry. But you have to let me make my own choices. Deanna Troy, played by Marina Sirtis, was the ship's counselor and had psychic abilities. She was always there for the crew, and often played a central role in taking care of the well-being of everyone on board the Enterprise. Tasha Yar, played by Denise Crosby, was the first female security chief. She was hand-picked by the captain, and because of a brutal past, had decided to pursue a career in security. What's Lieutenant Yar's condition? She's dead. While Tasha's death at the end of the first season wasn't liked by the critics, many fans still consider the lieutenant a favorite amongst the women on board the Enterprise. Someone 
who I would want to make proud of me, it's you. This is a dangerous creature. You have no idea. Why Picard would make her a member of the crew and not me? It must be terribly frightening for you to be totally defenseless after all of those centuries of being omnipotent. Whoopi Goldberg also joined the crew of the Enterprise as Guinan, a several hundred year old alien, full of wisdom and good advice for the crew. She appeared variously from the second season and in two next generation motion pictures. Think of me as an echo of the person you know. Ensign Ro Laren, played by Michelle Forbes, only appeared in eight episodes of The Next Generation, but left a lasting impression. Her character was so popular amongst fans that the studio wanted her to appear more often. Forbes decided to pursue other roles and has appeared in many other TV series, and her character eventually left Starfleet to join a paramilitary organization called the Marquis. And that our dinner table is the ready room of the Enterprise. Some of the characters from the next generation revisited their roles in Star Trek Picard. Cancel red alert! Bird tomato. Demonstrating how such loved characters have lived long beyond their original series.